Hello everyone and welcome to my 2018 question and answers video. Have you ever had an accident or injury in your workshop and if so how would you prevent it from happening again? Aside from the small cuts, scrapes and splinters that I receive pretty much every time I'm in the workshop, I've had one accident that I would class as serious. And I've still got a scar to prove it, which you can see here. Basically I managed to put a sharp chisel through my little finger and it went all the way through, so it was basically a flap. I'll put a picture on screen soon, so if you don't want to see it, please look away now. I was probably quite lucky because I think if my finger had been in a slightly different position I would have actually chopped the tip of the finger clean off. The accident was a result of bad chiseling technique. Since then my chiseling technique has improved a great deal so it's probably a case of learning a valuable lesson the hard way. I love your restoration videos. Do you have any YouTube channels you recommend who do this? I only know of two that I watch regularly and subscribe to and they are Dashner Design and Restorations and Ross Taylor Wood works. If anyone knows of any other good restoration channels on YouTube please put them down in the comments below I'd love to check them out and I'm sure others would too. I'm actually working on another furniture restoration video at the moment so that will be on my channel soon. What tips, tools and materials would you recommend for someone who wants to get into repairing and restoring old furniture? I think I've got four or five restoration projects on my channel so it's worth checking those out and seeing what tools I'm using there and I've also got a video about different types of finishes that might help. I'll link to all of those videos in the description box below. What is your long term plan for woodworking and would you maybe do it full time one day? I would definitely like like to do that but at the moment it's not financially viable. I have however requested a reduction of hours at my day job which was initially rejected but I'm still pursuing so hopefully I can go down to something like two or three days a week at my day job and then have two or three days a week doing woodworking. I am monitoring the financial side of my business quite closely so here's a breakdown for those interested. At the moment my business has multiple revenue streams of income and those are YouTube ad revenue, Patreon support, sales and commissions, and Amazon affiliate earnings. All of that totaled up over the past year works out to be an average of £802 per month. That's my monthly turnover. My business outgoings averaged over the past year work out to be £367 per month. That's to cover tools, rent for my storage space, fuel for my van, web hosting, materials, blades, screws, fixtures, finishes, all of that kind of stuff. So if I deduct that from my average monthly turnover, that leaves £435 average monthly profit. At the moment, I'm spending an average of 96 hours a month on my business. That includes woodworking and video editing, but doesn't include all of the other stuff like like social media, responding to emails, comments and admin which I tend to do in my spare time. So if I divide the £435 average monthly profit by 96 hours per month that works out to be £4.53 per hour. That is what I'm earning from my business. Obviously 20% of that is then payable as tax. The UK minimum wage is £7.83 per hour and the UK living wage is £8.75 an hour so at the moment my earnings are almost exactly half of the UK living wage. The 96 hours per month I spend working on my business are at the weekends and in the evenings so they are in addition to my daytime job which is 9 to 5 Monday to Friday. That means I'm working every day of the week and most evenings too at the moment. I love seeing when your cat wanders into the video, tell us more about him. So back in 2004 I just moved from London back to my hometown of Norwich in the UK and I was renting a house with a friend of mine and my housemate decided to get a four week old kitten called Dylan. So Dylan wasn't my cat but I got really attached to him and he seemed to want to spend all of his time with me so a couple of years later when my housemate decided to move into a new place with his girlfriend I was really worried that he would take Dylan with him but fortunately for me he decided that I could keep him. Since then we've moved around Norwich a few times in various flats and houses until 2011 when I moved into this house that we live in now. So he's 13 years old, that's 68 in cat years. His favourite pastimes include eating dreamies and playing with his dreamies toy, sleeping on his cat tree by the radiator and waking us up at five in the morning for no apparent reason. I'd be interested to hear how your dust extraction is performing particularly with 1.5 inch pipe and if you've had any jams or blockages. It's been four or five months since I installed the dust extraction system and I'll link to the video covering that in the description box below and since then I have had one blockage and that happened probably about a month ago. 
the blockage happened here and because I used push fit pipe fittings fortunately there was enough movement in the pipes to be able to get this section out entirely and clear the blockage and put it back in. It was a bit fiddly but it wasn't too bad. The blockage was my fault because I was hoovering up some shavings on my workbench that really were too big for my dust extraction system to cope with. The small 40mm diameter pipes that I used are only really capable of dealing with sawdust from my table saw, mitre saw, band saw, that sort of thing. And it does still function really well for that. I just need to make sure that I sweep up my shavings and leave the dust extraction just for sawdust. Pocket hole joinery. I'm not really a fan of it. It's not that I've got anything against it, it's just that I don't really enjoy the process of using pocket holes and I don't really like the way that they look either, even when plugged. So I just prefer using other joinery methods. How do you deal with neighbours that complain about the noise from power tools? I have made a conscious effort to buy or upgrade my tools to machines that are as quiet as possible. For example, my new dust extractor and air compressor run extremely quietly. My mitre saw and planer thicknesser both have induction motors, so they are as quiet as they can be. The one problem I still have is my table saw, which I love in every way apart from how noisy it is. I have been looking at new options with an induction motor, but I'm struggling to find one that's both small enough and has all of the features that I want in a table saw. One that interests me though is the Axminister TS200, but I really want to have a look at that before buying it and there are no Axminister stores anywhere near me. I have insulated the walls and the ceiling of my workshop to try and help contain noise and also heat. But if I could go back in time, I definitely would have used the rock wool sound insulation slabs that I used on my shed extension in the walls of my workshop too, because that stuff is brilliant. It is really expensive though. Generally, I just think it's important to be as considerate as possible with your neighbors. So for example, if my neighbors are in their garden enjoying a barbecue, I'm not going to come into the workshop and use my machines. I'll generally try and use hand tools instead or just find something that I can do that doesn't involve lots of noise. Are you going to make a central in May? I don't think so, mainly because I'm an introvert and I don't know if I would enjoy being at that kind of event. Would you consider doing limited tool projects where you only use five tools or machines? Yes, I had actually intended to do the recent plywood storage rack video using only cordless power tools and I was going to do the whole project in my garden. But unfortunately the weather conspired against me and also I was in a bit of a rush to finish off that project so I ended up doing it in the workshop instead. But yes, I would like to do something like that in future. I'd also like to do some hand tool only projects. I've got this idea about taking some hand tools to the beach, finding a piece of driftwood and trying to make something out of it while I'm at the beach. So I might do something like that at some point. Let me know if that's something that you guys want to see. Also, if you're into hand tool projects, definitely check out a channel called Timber and You by another UK woodworker called Clint. His videos are great and his channel has really inspired me to do more work with hand tools. I'll leave a link to that channel in the description box below. Before you built your shed, where did you used to do your woodwork? Mainly in the garden if the weather was okay, sometimes in the dining room, but this was before I had any large machines. Back then I was really just using a hand saw, a cordless drill, a belt sander, and some basic hand tools. If you want to see some of the projects I did with those tools, there's a section called Early Projects under the project section on my website where you can see some photos and articles. Have you switched to the Merca sander and will there be a review? Yes, I have. Uh, I may not do a full review video, but I'll definitely talk about my thoughts on the sander in my next vlog, so stay tuned for that. How do you ship or post the larger items that you sell? I use couriers, but I've had some really bad experiences recently. If you're going to use one of those courier comparison websites like parcel to go I'd highly recommend taking multiple photos of the item that you're sending with a tape measure held up against it, and also take a photo of of the item on some scales with the weight of the item visible. You'll need those as evidence when you get an email from parcel to go asking you to pay a fee because your item is overweight or oversized when you know for a fact that it wasn't. That's actually happened to me three times in the past four months and I haven't even been sending that many parcels. So I think with parcel to go there's either some sort of corrupt scam going on or their pricing algorithm just doesn't work properly. The couriers that I've had the worst experiences with are parcel force and also my Hermes. The couriers that I'm yet to have any issues with are Collect Plus and DPD. 
So they are my current preference, but maybe I've just been lucky with them. <laughs>